Welcome to the Newton tutorial series. I'm Mike Cruz with AC Tech, and in this tutorial I'm going to be discussing the inputs on the general simulation variables page here. The first input is the simulation time, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's just the total runtime of the simulation. Uh, just note that if you say that you're generating material for 60 seconds, but your simulation time is set for 25 seconds, the simulation will end at 25 seconds, regardless of any of the other inputs. The time step is if you want to uh, input your own custom fixed time step for the simulation. We don't necessarily recommend doing this because we like to calculate a variable time step, which is going to make the simulation faster anyway, but it's there if you'd like to use it. The critical time ratio, if you want to delve into that, it's probably best for you to read some papers on DEM, but basically it's a multiplier for the variable time step, and it can take anywhere in the range of you know 0 up to 0 0.2, and the higher you set this ratio, the faster the simulation will go, but there's an upper limit at which point you start to get uh, visual and, 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 and numerical artifacts, so what we, we call that um, the popcorn effect, so if I was to set this at 0 0.25, you know, it's going to throw an error saying, hey, you might get the popcorn effect. Is that what you want to do? And I'll show you what that is. Basically, the particles in this uh, cylinder, we're dropping particles in the cylinder, and the particles should just come to rest. But because the time step is being artificially inflated, the particles will overlap a little bit too much with each other, and they'll bounce around continuously. And it, you know, looks like popcorn. So that means that you've got this ratio set too high. And we recommend just setting that anywhere in the range of 0 0.16 to 0 0.2. It should be sufficient. But if you turn it down some more, it will result in a more stable simulation. Uh, AC Tech Acceleration Mode, uh, that's um, useful for when you have simulations with large masses of moving partic of, of non-moving particles, like if you have a bunch of particles sitting in a feeder bin uh, or, or at, the bottom of a, at the bottom of an emergency chute or something, it, it can speed up calculations in those areas. We're still um, implementing that and we hope to release it eventually, but um, for now it's disabled. The variable time step, like I said, what this does is it will adjust the size of the time step through the simulation based on the maximum speed of the particles as well as this max expected velocity. So that allows you to, um, you'll notice when you start out a simulation or, or when they're in a simulation with um, where you have a lot of slow moving particles, the simulation might actually go faster because it's, it's calculating that, hey, these particles aren't moving very fast so we can increase that time step and still maintain a stable simulation. The multiprocessing mode is how many threads Newton will create for the simulation, anywhere from 1 to 16 currently. Um, we have found that uh, if you have, uh, right, what I'm running right here is uh, eight, thread, eight, eight threads on my four core processor. And we found that depending on the processor, some processors like to use a multi-threading mode, so when I run simulations on this PC, I could set it to 8. But for many PCs, we've also found that it works better if you disable the hyper-threading and run instead in quad mode. So if I only had four cores here, or if I only had four threads, some PCs respond better in, uh, in that way. Uh, also, take note that uh, the multiprocessing mode, that the number of threads that Newton creates, is going to be limited by the domain of the simulation. So for example, I've got a simulation over here that's running, but take note of this really big cluster here. This one really big cluster. So when I switch this to color by CPU thread, you'll notice that if I count up these threads, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 threads, I had initially set the file to 16, but in between each of the colored threads there has to be a buffer, a cleanup thread. And that cleanup thread, the width of that cleanup thread is determined by the max particle size. It's, I want to say it's 1.25 times the max particle, uh, max particle length. So we could only fit 10 threads in here, but Newton is set to, only, to, is set to show 16. So when you set up your simulation, you could have set this to, instead you could set it to 12 or perhaps even 8 if you wanted to. And uh, it would have proceeded at the same speed because you physically can't fit more threads into the simulation. And you'll notice if you're using huge clusters, sometimes people will have lumps with a couple hundred uh, spheres in them. And that's going to result in really, really large cleanup threads and there's just nothing you can do about that.
the max particle overlap is the amount of overlap that we allow for the individual spheres. If uh, if you know anything about DEM, it uses soft particle dynamics, which means we physically allow the spheres to overlap. That's how the spring and dash pod system works. Uh, and the lower this particle overlap, the stiffer the particles. And we have found that a, a range of anywhere from you know two to five percent tends to be reasonable. If you want incredibly stiff particles, you could set it, you know, to 0.5%, but that is definitely going to increase the computation time for your simulation. Likewise, if we were to change it up to 25%, the simulation would go much faster, but now we're sacrificing the integrity of the simulation by allowing so much overlap. So again, we recommend 2 to 5 there. The max expected velocity is what Newton the, the base value that Newton uses when calculating this variable time step. So you want to make sure that you set this in the general neighborhood of what you expect the fastest velocity will be for the material. So if you're running a feeder belt simulation and none of the material is going to be moving faster than one meter per second, make sure you turn this down to one meter per second. Because the time step, the smallest, uh, the, the largest size of the time step is going to be limited by this expected velocity. So make sure you adjust that to correspond within 15% of the actual expected velocity of the simulation. Kill particle velocity, simply when a velocity, when a particle exceeds this velocity, we remove it from the simulation. And it's more of a safety net than anything else because generally, let's say you have a simulation with moving surfaces and you accidentally pinch a particle between two surfaces. Well, it's going to squeeze that particle tighter and tighter until at some point the particle finally shoots off with a you know, 100,000 meters per second velocity or, or something ridiculous. And you wouldn't want that particle to bump into the other particles and disturb the reality of the simulation. So instead, we simply remove it. But that rarely happens, and this is more of a just a safety net than anything else. The sphere size ratio, uh, again, you should uh, read papers on DEM if you want to understand a little bit more about this, but this determines the size of the 3D grid that Newton uses to do its uh, uh, contact detection. And if you set this to 1.0, basically it's saying that each grid cell, the size of each grid cell will be exactly equal to the largest sphere in any cluster in the simulation. If you were to set this up to 2, it's going to double that. And if you double the size of the cell, you're going to allow significantly more particles into each cell. It's going to increase your contact detection time. So generally, you don't really need to mess with this. Anywhere in the name in the range of one to one point one is sufficient. The directional collision ratio is a number that helps determine how often we update the the list of particles that are in each grid. And again, if you want to understand more about this, you should read some papers on DEM. But a value of 2.0 is the most restrictive. It, it assumes that, hey, let's assume that we have particles that are moving at directly at each other with the maximum expected velocity. Well, now, how often do we need to assume those particles could be changing grid cells? But, you know, how often do you have that in a DEM simulation? I mean, for the most part, all your material is going to move, be moving in relatively the same direction. So you can usually, a value of 1.25 or 1.5 is, is sufficient, and you probably don't even need to mess with that. Uh, similar with the moving triangle cell update, this says how often do we update the cells that each triangle is in. If we have moving triangles, then we need to periodically you know, let Newton know where are those triangles in the simulation. And just like with this collision ratio, probably don't need to mess with it. A value of 0 0.95 is going to be... Um, value of 0 0.95 is uh, sufficient. 0 0.5 is probably fine. You probably don't need to mess with that. Uh, the preferred thread search direction. This says, how do we want to divide the threads? So if I go back to the simulation here, you can see that right now the y-axis is the long axis for the simulation. If I look at my particles, color by CPU thread, it's, it detected that and it's dividing them along the y-axis. That's going to be the fastest axis. So if you're running a simulation like this where you know for darn sure that you know the y-axis will be the best way to divide those particles, or if you had, say, a linear transfer such that you had a, a this conveyor belt was feeding another conveyor belt moving in that same direction, still, the y direction is going to be fastest. But you can usually just leave this on auto and Newton will 
periodically look at the simulation and, and it will say, well, is there a better way to do it this time? Should I switch that thread direction? And it will usually take care of it very well. The playback file save time interval is how often do we want to print a frame to the output file. So those frames, again, they contain all the particle data, triangle data, force data, work data, all of that. So the, the more often we save a data frame, the larger the file size. So if I save a data frame every 0.01 seconds instead of every 0.02, my file size just doubled. And it's generally not necessary to go any smaller than 0.01, especially if you're trying to keep a decent file size. But again, you can set that to whatever you'd like. PNG file save time. If you want, Newton can print a screenshot every specified number of seconds. I could print a screenshot every one second. And what that would do is every time this simulation completes another second, it would take a screenshot based on the current view of the model. So if you're doing those screenshots, make sure you set up the model so it's whatever view you want to see in those screenshots. Because right now I'd be looking at just the CPU threads the whole time. Maybe I'd want to make sure I want to set that to velocity or something more useful so that I actually get some information out of those screenshots. Save triangle force and work data. This is one of the main, imp th this is the the value that you, you need to set this to yes in order to save that triangle work data or force data. So when you're looking in your playback file and you want to be looking at triangle wear or, um, or triangle forces, if you didn't set this value to yes, you won't be able to do that. The, the reason that you wouldn't always set this to yes is because it's going to vastly increase the size of your file depending on the number of triangles. It could increase your file size by 50%, it could increase your file size by 10 times. It really depends on the number of triangles and the length of the simulation. Same with the particle force and work data. If you want to be looking at the particle forces or the particle wear, you need to set this to yes. But again, that's going to increase the size of your file based on the number of particles in the simulation. It could be a little bit bigger. It could be a heck of a lot bigger. Restart file is pretty self-explanatory. If your computer crashes, you lose power, someone shuts your computer down, something stupid like that, you Newton will periodically spit out a restart file and then it will automatically when you when you restart the simulation, you can restart from that file and continue with your simulation. So when you use the restart file, you would then have two separate output files. You'd have two separate output data files. And there's a function in here that we'll talk about in another tutorial that allows you to merge those together to create one single playback file. Uh, restart files, the save time interval is how often do we want to print that restart file. Two seconds is usually sufficient. You can turn it down if you want. It doesn't really matter because the restart files generally aren't any larger than 20 to 200 megabytes. So compared to a 10 gigabyte file, you know, who cares? Overwrite restart file. If you want to save all the restart files from every one second or from every two second interval, just switch this to no and that would save all of those restart files. But generally you don't really need that so you can just allow it to delete the restart files as it creates the next one. The grid on the right hand side is just the file system for the current simulation. Hard drive letter is self-explanatory. These following one, two, three, four, five, six, the next six of these are just base directories for where you're going to save the data for this simulation. We put six of them because when we do our DEM simulations, we like to organize them based on the client name and the job and the shoot and the revision. It's just easier than having to have a single input where we have to keep track of all these folders. The file name is just the base file name that Newton will use for all of the simulation files in that folder. And the comments is just a little section for you to put a few notes on this main page. If you wanted to have a couple notes about, oh, this was uh, revision 3 from Mike's design, whatever you want to say. It obviously has no effect on anything in the simulation. It's purely just for comments. This button here will save your default file name and base directories. So if you know that you're always working in our directories are called DEM data, you know, and we always are, or maybe we're working always with the same client, client 
23. You can click Save Default File Location. Then whenever you create a new input file or if you, whenever you open Newton, it will always recall those same folder and file names. So I think that covers everything on this page. And if there's any other questions you have that aren't covered in the manual or in the other tutorials, then feel free to shoot us an email at info at ac Thanks.